everyone, welcome back to my channel, Beautiful Minutia, if you're new here. My name is Tiffany and welcome to day seven of the 12 days of Christmas. This video is gonna be a little bit different because I'm going to be ranking the Nintendo Switch games that I played in 2023. So some of you may not be interested in this and that's okay. I know that a few of you are who are regular subscribers, but if you're new here, welcome. I mostly talk about books. This is a booktube channel, but I do occasionally talk about video games, other things that I'm enjoying. I do a lot of kind of cozy vlogging. So definitely Nintendo Switch games do make appearances in the videos that I make, but if you're interested in books, stick around because that is the majority of what I post here. My daughter got a Nintendo Switch about a year and a half ago, and since then I have re-immersed myself in the world of video gaming, which I used to really love when I was younger, but I've really only ever played on Nintendo systems. So it was natural for me to go back to Nintendo Switch and be able to play Zelda games, Mario games, and those kinds of things. And we have an online account, so I was able to, you know, play games that I grew up playing. And so that's super fun. But on the Nintendo Switch, you don't just have, you know, games that are put out by Nintendo, but a lot of uh, indie games and third party games and those kinds of things. So a lot of the games that I have here are that. And I did play a lot of cozy games this year, but as you'll see, it's it's not only cozy games. That is some of what I play, but not all of what I play. So let's go ahead and get into the ranking. I have, I think, 29 games here, and I'm going to attempt to screen record my, my tier ranking, so hopefully I'll be able to show that up on the screen. But if not, I will show, you know, screen grabs or screenshots of the tier ranking as I go. Okay, so I have my tiers here. I have S through C, S being the best. I could have done lower, but I didn't really feel like I needed it. Most of the games I played this year were pretty decent. So I was going to go in the order that I played them, but my computer automatically went ahead and alphabetized them. So we're going in alphabetical order. So we're starting with Baldo. Baldo is an adventure game that has a lot of callbacks to Zelda, but with like a Studio Ghibli kind of animation and feel to it. It's pretty expansive. It's kind of a longer game and the developers have given people who have purchased the game either two or three free DLCs. And I started with a DLC and beat that and then went on to play the main game, which is the Guardian Owl, I think. I liked it, but I got really burnt out towards the end. Parts of it were really fun. Parts of it were a little bit not great in terms of glitching or getting stuck or just different things like that and things like you can kind of like fall off a ledge that kills you sometimes and then other times it doesn't from something that's the same length. So there are things about it that like weren't perfect, but it was a lot of fun. I just got kind of burnt out on it because a lot of the dungeons started feeling kind of same in terms of puzzles and battles and that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna put Baldo in the B. Next up we have Bear and Breakfast. And this one I didn't play very long, but I did get it very shortly after it came out because it looked so cute. You are a bear who goes away from home and ends up finding this place to fix up into a bear and bed and breakfast. And it's really, the humor is good and stuff, but I didn't get very far in the game because the controls are very far from intuitive on the Nintendo Switch. And I've heard that from a lot of people. It's one I wanna try again because I started playing it having only played like Breath of the Wild and Animal Crossing and Nintendo first party games that are made for the Nintendo Switch. I think I might be able to figure out the controls better now, but I have heard that from everyone, even people who are more seasoned gamers, that the controls on the Switch are just not great. So we're putting this one in the C tier. Next up we have Child of Light. And this is a platforming RPG game that you kind of build a team in it. So you have different members of your party that can do different attacks for like turn-based attacks. And it's an interesting game. It's very whimsical feeling. The soundtrack is lovely, the graphics, 
are just beautiful and you play as this princess who's been banished to like this mirror world when your father's sick and your evil stepmother sends you over there and you're trying to battle your way back but help the people that you encounter along the way. It's pretty much all written in rhyme and so that's kind of cute. But the battles are actually pretty challenging at times. It's not a super long game. I think it's around 10 hours of gameplay but I thought it was phenomenal, really, really well done. So I'm putting Child of Light in the A tier. Next up we have Dave the Diver, which has gotten a lot of notoriety since it's come out the second part of 2023. I actually have only played the demo for this, but I'm still including it because I loved it. I thought it was really uniquely done. So it's kind of like a dungeon crawler roguelike kind of thing in a way because you are Dave who dives down and you are trying to kill these fish <laughs> to then you bring to a sushi restaurant in the evening, which you manage and you create the menu and everything based on the fish that you've caught that day. And so it's got some management as well as a lot of fighting fish that are coming after you. And it just, the humor in it's really quirky and interesting too. I, it's really fun and it's one that I want to purchase the full game as soon as possible. So that one is going in A tier also. Next up we have Disney Dreamlight Valley, which is a cozy game where you play as someone who is in, this Disney world, this valley that has all these Disney characters in it and there is story things to it in that they don't remember who you are or things about themselves and you have to help them remember with different side quests and things. And this was just like pure nostalgic fun. It was kind of, I was looking for something to fill the Animal Crossing gap in my life and this has a lot of similar elements to Animal Crossing in terms of decoration and clothing you can purchase, different things like that but it does not run very well on the Switch, to be honest. And the, some of the side quests end up getting kind of grindy, which I mean, that's, that's cozy game life, isn't it? To have grindy side quests. But if you grew up with Disney like I did, I think that you'll actually really enjoy this game. I ended up getting it on a very, very steep sale when it was still in like kind of beta testing. It was supposed to be free to play, but it's not. They still have all kinds of like microtransactions and then they released it as a game that you have to pay for, including the new DLC, which I will not be paying $30 for because I fell off. It got old after a while um, and I just didn't, it doesn't have the same quality that a game like Animal Crossing does. So I'm putting Disney Dreamlight Valley in the B tier. Next up we have Fay Farm, which is another game <laughs> that I didn't purchase. They had a free to play week on the Nintendo Switch for online members and I took advantage of that because I was really intrigued by this farming game where you play in this beautiful, bright, whimsical world with fairies and all kinds of really fun stuff and it looked really fun, but it was $60, which is crazy crazy and I guess on other systems you can purchase the base game for like $40 but on the Switch they make you get the deluxe edition which comes with the DLCs that they are then releasing which is great I guess but I was just like I don't know if I want to pay this much. It was on sale at the time so I'm like well it's like $45 right now so if I love it I guess I'll know for when it goes on sale. And it was fun. There were some really good things about it. Like for example, when you are doing something, you don't have to switch through your tools. It just selects the right tool for you automatically. And that was really cool. And things like unlimited storage inventory. And so there were some quality of life things that were great, but I felt like the story was kind of dumb and really grindy and very lackluster once you kind of get to like your second dungeon, mines, whatever. And then also like the NPCs are awful. <laughs> they have no personality at all. So if you're looking for something that has any sort of personality to it, this game doesn't have that, but it is really fun with a world that's fun to explore and stuff. But the price tag is really what brings it down for me because I feel like Fae Farm is a game that full price would be good for like $30 and I wouldn't even pay $30 for it. I would pay like maybe 20. Like it is not even close to worth a $60 price tag even if you put hours into it because I ended up in that free trial I ended up putting like 15 hours into it and was sick of it before the week was even up. So for sure not worth it. It is like 
definitely, definitely C tier in my opinion. I think Bear and Breakfast is still worse just because of the controls and how it runs on the Switch. But I will say that Fae Farm did actually run pretty well on the Switch, which I didn't think it would based on its graphics. Next up we have Figment, which is a puzzle solving game. And I liked the premise of this. I liked the music. You're kind of in someone's head. I'm pretty sure like you're in the mind and you're trying to figure this out and beat like nightmares and different things like that. But I thought that the main character that you're playing and its little sidekick bird thing, they were obnoxious as heck. So I did not get very far in this game. I would like to maybe give it another try, but I can't, you can't really put it on mute so you don't have to listen to them talk because not only is the music great, but some of the battles and stuff have like rhythm elements to it. So you need to be listening to it. So Figment for me personally was a B tier game. I'm gonna put it higher than Disney Dreamlight Valley, but lower than Baldo because I honestly, it wasn't like it was terrible. It just like wasn't for me. So that's this case for some of these games. Some of these games have been people's like favorite game of the year. So my ranking may be very different than yours just because we have different tastes. So it doesn't mean it's a bad game. I just wasn't driving with it. Next up we have a garden story. Oh my gosh, this game is really cute. So this is a game that combines cozy elements definitely with some combat because you play as this cute little grape and something called the rot is taking over this garden themed world. There's a summer place, a spring place, an autumn place, and a winter place. And so you have to go and you have to figure out what's going on. There's combat. You have to do these like tasks that are required of you every day on like this bulletin board for the town. And as you do those tasks, it actually levels up your town, which will unlock more weapons and more things from the shop. And I just thought this game was really, really fun. I really enjoyed it. I think that there were some repetitive elements to it in that like the tasks that you're asked to do for the town on the bulletin board, they cycle through pretty often. But by the time you start getting sick of doing those tasks, then you can just like leave and go to the next town, go to the next element of the story. So it didn't really bother me too much. I thought it was just like an absolute blast, definitely in the A tier and so far like the top of A tier for me. Next up we have Gris, which is the most beautiful platforming, sort of a little bit puzzle solving game I have ever played. The graphics are incredible. You play as this girl and you're going through this colorless world and as you go through each level you're unlocking a new color to add to the world and so it's beautiful with like line drawing but then like these bursts of like watercolor colors that are just so gorgeous and apparently it's supposed to be going through the stages of grief. I actually have not totally finished this game and it's because I didn't want it to be over <laughs> so it's one that I want to play again and let myself be okay with playing a shorter game start to finish because it's not a long a length of gameplay, but it is just like absolutely gorgeous, beautiful story, so soothing to play, gorgeous soundtrack, easy, easy S here. Next we have Jenny LeClue Detective Vu, which is a story like a point and click mystery story about a young girl who discovers a murder and she's just trying to figure things out. Her mom is a forensic professor at a college and so she's got a lot of input from her mom and, and how to solve crimes and stuff. The storyline of this was an absolute blast. I had so much fun playing this, but I will say point and clicks are not my favorite. And I think that there are elements of the puzzles. Some of them were really fun. Some of them were really not as fun. And some of them were actually repetitive, kind of the same puzzles that got cycled through, but I had lots of quirky humor and was a lot of fun. I ended up getting this one on sale for $2, which it's totally worth $2 but full price, it's like $25. It is not worth $25. Do not pay more than like five, maybe $10 for this game. So I think for its price, like it's full point price, I would have been really disappointed with it. But because I only got it for $2, I thought it was super fun and I really, really enjoyed my time with it. So I'm putting that at the top, I think, of the B tier. Next up, we have Mineko's Night Market, which was the game I was most excited about releasing this year. Actually, it's not true. Tears of the Kingdom was most favorite. But after Tears of the Kingdom was Mineko's Night Market, where you play as this girl who has moved to this new town and her cat's everywhere 
here and you can pet the cats. It's a cozy game, but it's crafting. So it's not a farming game. So you go along and you gather up things to make these things that you can then sell once a week at the night market. And as you sell more things at the night market, you kind of haggle with the customers on the price. You earn money to purchase things, but in addition, as you sell more items, the night market levels up and more booths open and all that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, there's a mystery going on of this giant cat that there's been a sighting of and these agents that are capturing cats in cages. And you don't know what's going on, so you're trying to figure out that. And that whole thing is kind of like a stealth mode puzzle solving kind of a thing with the cats. And it is just like, it's such a fun game. I do think that there were moments where you had to make certain crafts to get past certain points in the game. And as a result of that, you there were items you couldn't access for those crafting things. And so you were kind of like in this more standstill and couldn't progress the story. So it got a little bit repetitive and hairy in those sections for me, in addition to some frame rate drops. And there were some game breaking glitches when this first dropped, but it got better in my opinion. <laughs> I think that there were things I noticed, like first of all, there were no great game breaking glitches by the time I purchased this game, but there were certain things like, oh, well, when you're crafting at this specific crafting bench, it's gonna, you have to wait like a good, like 30 seconds to a minute before it loads. And I noticed by the end of my time playing that game that it was no longer doing that. So they've improved it with patches and stuff. I thought that this game was really sweet, really adorable. The art style was wonderful. Um, and, and it was unique in that it was a crafting game and not a farming game. So this one is an A tier game for me. Next up we have Moonlighter. Moonlighter I thought was gonna be kind of like a more cozy game. It, it's not, there's like dungeon crawling mixed with shop management. So kind of like Dave the Diver, but not really because you are someone who is a shop owner by day and at night you wanna become a hero. So you are exploring these caves and stuff and you have to fight and you get items to bring back to sell in your shop during the day. And I like the way that it was set up and it was interesting except that the dungeons just had a lot of sameness to me and I was I just got kind of bored with it. Maybe I need to give it another try, I don't know. But I just, I just didn't have that much fun with it. It just felt really repetitive to me. And I don't know, for me personally, I would say that this is a C tier game. I, I think a lot of people really love it though. So if you like dungeon crawling plus management, you might actually really love this one. Next up we have Hoa and Hoa reminds me of Gris in the way that it's a platforming puzzle solver with beautiful graphics, beautiful music, but it looks a lot different than Gris. And I loved this one too. This is another one that I didn't finish because it's short gameplay and I just wasn't ready for it to be over yet. So I need to go back and finish this one, but it's just so lovely. And I actually have the music from this saved on a playlist for music that I listen to when I read. I think Hoa is just so gorgeous, A tier game. Next we have My Time at Porsche, which is another cozy game. And this one's really interesting because it takes place in a town and you come and you're a new builder in the town. So rather than this being a farming game, though you can do some farming if you want to with animals and crops, but you don't actually have to, Basically what you're doing is you're creating and building things for this town to help it expand and grow. So you end up building a bridge so you can get to a new island or you build this device and you go into the mines and you collect different resources and then you build like smelting things to then melt that down into bars that you can use to build other things. And it just felt very unique compared to a lot of farming games that I had tried and I really liked that about it. I liked that a lot of the townspeople were voice actors and I thought that that was a really cool touch. It runs real janky on the Switch though. I'm just saying, it does not run very good on the Switch. There's a lot of frame rate drops, a lot of glitches, a lot of things that just were not the best. I, I don't think I ever had to like turn it off and lose a whole day. I don't think that that ever happened, but it also made me kind of like motion sick at times with the camera sensitivity, which is an issue I had with Disney Dreamlight Valley as well 
which is another reason why Disney Dreamlight Valley is as low as it is. But my time at Portia is really expansive. There's a lot to do, a lot to explore. You can become friends with the townspeople. You can date townspeople, marry them, have children. I didn't quite get that far. I did get into like dating someone, but I never got farther than that because I started getting a little bit burnt out on it. But it was really fun. I really liked it. I think I would have been disappointed with it if I had spent a higher price tag on it. But the sequel game to this, My Time at Sandrock, had just come out and or was about to come out. And so I got this for $6, <laughs> which is a really great, um, but it has a lot of the same elements that a lot of cozy games do. There's decorating you can do in your home. But with the decorating, you actually level up your health and stamina with different things that you have in your house, which is something that was interesting and unique. So there are things that it does that is really cool that other games don't do, but it does run janky on the Switch. So if I was being objective, I would put it in B tier, but quite honestly, I really loved this game. So I'm putting it in A tier, but it's like at the bottom of the A tier because of how it runs. Next up, we have Oceanhorn. Ocean Horn was me trying to fill the Zelda void in my heart while I waited for Tears of the Kingdom to come out. This has a lot of Wind Waker vibes. So you're a boy that you're going from island to island, you're fighting things, you're solving puzzles and dungeons and getting the items that you need. I ended up not finishing this game because the dungeons just started feeling really similar to me. Same kind of thing with Baldo, but it wasn't as long of a game as Baldo. And I didn't enjoy it as much as I enjoyed Baldo, honestly. It felt like very, very repetitive. And it was kind of weird in that when you defeat enemies after a certain amount of time, not very long, by the way, they would pop right back up on the screen. So you'd have to defeat them over and over again if you'd have to backtrack. And that was really annoying. I thought that the cutscenes were really cheesy and weird. And so there are a lot of things that were just like, eh, it was okay. And I played it for a decent amount of time. I got like almost to the end of the game, but then I was just like, uh, no, I think I'm done. So I think, I know I played this game more than I played some of the other games in C tier, but I think that this is honestly a C tier game that's probably not really worth it. Next up we have two Paper Mario games that I played this year. So first of all, I replayed the original Paper Mario because we have an online Switch subscription. So I was able to replay it through um, the Nintendo 64 one. And I had played this several times as a kid and a teenager. So fun to be able to replay this one. I love the humor in Paper Mario games. I love the turn-based RPG. I love the companions that you get along the way. Just so fun. Really, really loved this one. It was so fun and nostalgic to revisit this one. So this one's definitely A tier. I think, uh, you know, I think I'm going to put it at the top of A tier for right now. Next we have Origami King Paper Mario. And at first I started trying to play this in 2022 and I couldn't. I hated the battle system because this is like other Paper Mario games in that it is a turn-based RPG, but the the battling is like a puzzle that you have to solve in a certain amount of time to get the hits in that you need to get. And I hated that. But then I picked it up again after playing the regular Paper Mario. And once I adjusted to the battling and you also get some things that help like extend the time and give you hints or things like that. And so that made it easier too. But once we got to that, I loved it so much. I thought that this was like top tier humor of all the Paper Mario games that I have played, this is probably my favorite in terms of all the hidden like little achievements and Easter eggs. And there's this villain who's an origami guy and he like folds up toads into different shapes or hides them in places and you have to find all the toads. And the music was phenomenal. So this is really, I really loved it. This is controversial, but for me, it is it is actually an S tier game. Next up, we have Potion Permit, which is another cozy game. In this game, you are an alchemist and you move to a town where the mayor's daughter is very, very sick and the local doctor cannot heal her through his means. So they call you in from the capital city, but they have had other alchemists come in before from the capital and have done some damage. And so there's not trust there. So you end up healing the daughter and then you're trying to build trust with the townsfolk. You go out and you forage and you get ingredients to make potions 
to help cure people when they come to your clinic and they're sick. The so certain elements are like a common cozy game that you can build relationships with the townspeople, you can end up dating townspeople, but there are things that are very different in terms of how you do the potions. Each individual thing that you get in that you're foraging, they have a different shape and each potion is almost like this Tetris looking kind of a thing where you have to fit the different blocks into it. So it's like a puzzle to make these potions and then to diagnose the people who come to your clinic it's like rhythm based games to diagnose what's wrong with them and see which potion that you need so there's a lot of things about it that were really really fun and unique and there's different kind of biomes that you can visit to get different things and i just i thought it was really really fun i would say out of a lot of the cozy games that i played this year this was one of my favorite ones and so this is an A tier one for me. I think, I think I'm gonna put it here behind Hoa and Garden Story. Next up, we have another game that I only played the demo for, but I'm counting it anyway because I loved the demo so much that once I got Christmas money, I bought the full game and it actually won Indie Game of the Year. And that is Sea of Stars. Sea of Stars is an RPG game and I think it's also turn-based if I'm remembering correctly and you can play as one of two different characters who are like have the power of the sun or the power of the moon and it, you travel with these other companions and there's so much like humor and friendship in it that was just so so lovely I thought it was so much fun the graphics were great and I can't wait to play more of this because the demo was kind of small and definitely wish it was more but I'm really looking forward to playing more of it because it was a demo and I didn't play quite as much I'm not gonna rank it as high in the A tier but I did like it more than I liked Dave the Diver. Next up we have Stardew Valley and yes I had never played Stardew Valley <laughs> until September of 2023 and I'm like what have I been doing with my life this game consumed me there's a couple games on here I have a lot of games that I loved but there's only a couple games that like swallowed me up and whenever I was not playing this game I was thinking about this game and Stardew Valley is one of them you probably already know about this farming sim that a lot of more recent farming games have taken a lot of things from Stardew Valley and so it was kind of a jet setter in a lot of ways and really revived kind of those cozy farming games on the Nintendo Switch. This game, I think what I love so much about this game is there is so much that you can do but in addition to that there's a lot of like really quirky humor and all of the NPCs that live in this town that you move to they all have such distinct personalities and they are so much fun. I just love them they I just oh my gosh it's so good and I love that like when you befriend them you can like then get access to go into their bedrooms and you can explore and like go up to things and it will tell you what they are and it's like so funny and quirky and so many little hidden things like that this is one of my favorite games of the year so it's s tier although I did get kind of burnt out on it and I want to restart <laughs> another farm next up we have submerged Submerged is a really short little game. It's about two hours worth of gameplay. And in it, you are this girl who travels to this submerged city with your brother. And as the days go on, he's really ill and he's injured and you're trying to find medical things to help him. And as you do that, you uncover the backstory of how you got to where you are, in addition to finding these little secrets that tell you how the city itself became submerged. So it's kind of a more unique setting. I loved like the kind of open world exploration of it, even though it's not a gigantic world, it was still a lot of fun. There's different landmarks you can find, different animals you can find for different achievements and all of that kind of stuff. I really liked it. I thought it was fun. I got it for like a dollar or two dollars. And I think that if I had paid more for that, I would not have been pleased because it's so short. But it actually ran really well on the Switch, which I was kind of surprised based on the graphics and how much water there was in the game. But because it was so short, it wasn't that impactful. I'm putting it in the B tier. Next up we have Super Mario Wonder, which my daughter got for Christmas. And I have not played this game individually. I've only played it with Peter and Claire and it is so fun to play in a group. This is a 2D platformer and it is so 
so much fun. You are just traversing this world and trying to get your way through and you can help each other if you're playing with other people. So if you die, other people can resurrect you. And there are just different things that you can do to kind of increase or decrease the difficulty level like if you play as certain characters they don't take enemy damage and so it makes it really accessible for a wide range of people but you're going through the world and then you hit these wonder seeds and when you do that the whole world just goes wacky and kind of tilts upside down you have no clue what is going to happen it's so crazy and fun and quirky and we just like absolutely love this game i think a lot of people would put it in the s tier uh but Based on how far I've played it and my level of enjoyment, it's A tier, but it is like the top of A tier. It's so fun. I could see it potentially becoming an S tier over time, but it's not one that I really want to play on my own. So that's why I'm putting it in A tier. Next, we have Tears of the Kingdom. This is the latest Zelda installment on the Nintendo Switch, and it is a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild, which Zelda doesn't normally do that. Usually they do something totally different, but this is a direct sequel set in the same world, but greatly expanded upon. And I think given a lot of upgrades in terms of abilities that you have or just different things that you could do that you couldn't do in Breath of the Wild. So I actually liked Tears of the Kingdom better and thought it had a better story. And I just like, oh my word. I think this game was robbed and should have for sure been game of the year can't believe it was not it's absolutely my game of the year and the same for a lot of other people that I've talked to absolutely love this this is like top of the top of S tier for me next up we have tunic tunic looks so cute you play as this adorable little fox it's kind of got Zelda vibes because of the color of the tunic that he is wearing and you're like oh my gosh it's like zelda with a cute little fox it's so adorable wrong this is not a cute game this is the hardest game that i played all year <laughs> like the combat is difficult there are puzzles to solve you have to really really engage your brain and even then you might still need some help from some wikis because I definitely did because this game does not hand you anything on a silver platter. There's lots of exploration, lots of things to do, but you don't know a lot of things. So as you go, you uncover these pieces of paper that are part of a game manual that tells you what to do, but half of that game manual is not in English. It's in a, like a random made up language. So there's only so much that you can infer from the game manual and the creators of this game we're purposely trying to show what it's like to play a game as a kid when you can't read very well. And that was so fun how we did that. This game is beautiful, has an incredible like lo-fi soundtrack. The story was so interesting, so good. Every level was better than the last. And yeah, this is the hardest game that I played this year, but it's also one of my favorite games. I adored this game so so much tunic is like easy easy s tier for me and actually pretty sure it's like my second favorite game of the year next up we have a silly little game called turn a boy commits tax evasion this is a short little game in which you play as a turnip and the mayor of the town who is an onion comes to you and says hey you haven't paid your taxes so now you have to do all these little chores for me that are like shifty and underhanded or else i'm throwing you in jail so you go on these little tasks and quests for the mayor not knowing really truly what he's up to but it is so funny. The humor in this game is incredible. Like the games that are funny have quirky humor in them like Stardew Valley and the Origami King and, and Turnip Boy are all games that make it into the S tier. I found that I really love games that have really quirky humor in it. So this is, this is one of my favorite games of the year and I'm super excited because in January, Turnip Boy Robs a Bank comes out and I can't wait to play that. Next up we have Underhero, which is a platforming RPG in which you play as a minion who is trying to, you know, stop the hero from getting to the boss, just like all the minions do, and you kill the hero. So now you're kind of taking over the role of the hero in this story. You've inher inherited his sword hilt as a companion and a guide, and there is definitely, like, some Zelda references there with kind of, like, Skyward Sword with, like, the sword that talks to you and that kind of stuff. And 
it has such great humor. You can talk to every enemy before you battle them. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's informative. The combat, it can have like some rhythm elements to it to help you out. I'll, I'll be honest, I've not yet figured that all the way out. This is the game that I'm currently playing while I'm recording this video and I love it. I am over the halfway point in this game. I'm pretty sure I think I only have like one more level or maybe two after where I am right now and it is just a blast. I am loving this game so much. This is for sure an S tier. It's not one that I have really heard people talk about, which is really a shame because it is so, so much fun. Next, we have Untitled A Goose Game. In this game, you play as a goose, just causing havoc wherever you go. And it's hilarious. It's really funny. So you have like a to-do list as this goose to like, you know, untie a kid's shoe and steal their toy and then make them play with another toy or make them wear the wrong pair of glasses or different things. It's just crazy and it's just a lot of fun. Now, apparently you can play this in two player mode where you and someone else are also a goose causing double the chaos. And I've not yet done this and I need to. This is a really fun game. I really liked it a lot. It's pretty short though. So I am gonna put it, I'm putting it in A tier, I think. I think I'm gonna put it behind Hoa because it's really, really fun, but it's one that I wouldn't get unless I could buy it on sale, which I did, just because it's there's not like a ton to it and it's not that long of a game. Next we have Paleo, which just came out in December, free to play on the Switch. So I downloaded it because it was free to play. And you know what? It looks exactly like Disney Dreamlight Valley, even though it doesn't have Disney characters, but it's very similar. Like when I was playing it, Peter came in and he's like, this looks like that Disney game you used to play. I'm like, it, it does, it has the exact same feel to it. It actually runs a little bit better on the Switch than Disney Dreamlight Valley does, but it is like this mythical land and there are elves there who are all purple for some reason. I don't know. It's a pretty game. It's interesting. You can decorate your house. You can farm. You can fish. You can get to know townspeople. There's lots of different things that you can do in it. I... I think it's it's big appeal is that it's an MMO so you can play online with other characters and work on things together and there are other people on on at the same time as you and stuff and so I think that that's the main appeal for it but I wasn't wowed by it I thought it was just okay I lost interest in it pretty quickly and yeah I think it's fine I like the fact that it's free to play so you know it was no harm to try it out and I think based on the fact that it's free to play it's actually pretty pretty good and they have definitely put a lot into it but for me it's it's a B tier game and it's below Disney Dreamlight Valley even though I think it runs better on the Switch but it didn't have it just wasn't as fun I guess. Lastly we have Bug Fables which is a turn-based RPG that is essentially just like Paper Mario but with bugs and you play as bugs and the humor in it is so good just like Paper Mario and the story was really interesting. This is one that I actually did not finish. I was close to the end but then I got consumed by Tears, or not Tears of the Kingdom, by Stardew Valley and didn't go back to it. So it's one that I want to go back to because I was I was in the last level and super enjoying it. This is an A tier game and like tippy tippy top of A tier for me. I had so much fun with this. Well, those are all the Nintendo Switch games I played this year. Actually, it's a lie. There's a couple that I barely played at all. And so I didn't really feel like it was fair to rank them. So those are ones that maybe I'll, maybe I'll play next year because I have a nice backlog of games. But I hope that you enjoyed this video. I'd love to hear from you in the comments down below what is your favorite game that you have played this year? Whether you have a Switch, whether you have something else, do you prefer cozy games or more other different types of games? I love talking about video games. That's become a big hobby for me, not quite as high as reading, but pretty close. So definitely would love to chat with you in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please hit like and also subscribe so you can continue to see some occasional Switch content from me, but if you would like to see bookish content from me, that is the majority of what I do. So if you like cozy bookish kind of things, consider subscribing and I will see you again tomorrow for another of the 12 days of Christmas.